Hi, everyone. We're going to let some folks come through here before we start the program. So thanks for being here. Welcome everyone. All right, we're gonna get started. Thank you for being with us for this very special program. As we can see with the messages coming through, there's a lot of excitement for these artists. My name is Lindy Lettinen and with my colleague, Sally Martin Katz, we co-curated this exhibition at SFMOMA of two commissioned projects by local artists, Irina Alejo and Adrian L. Burrell. It opened last month and it will be on view through September 6th, so go see it. These are two installation views, if you could go to the next slide, of their distinct projects, which share a gallery on the third floor of the museum. Irina Alejo and Adrian L. Burrell's work was brought together in an exhibition at SFMOMA as part of the series Bay Area Walls. In these commissions, both artists respond to the storefront murals and signage that have appeared in San Francisco and Oakland during the pandemic. By documenting these murals and people, both artists preserve the visual conversation taking place within our local communities. Exploring themes of legacy and family, Alejo and Burrell both tell personal incisive stories of Bay Area life that provoke larger conversations about the simmering tensions and injustices profoundly felt in these urban spaces. So the format for this program will include presentations by Irina Alejo and Adrian L. Burrell, followed by a conversation with the artists moderated by scholars Dr. Tiffany Barber and Kazumi Chin. And then finally, a special question and answer session between all of the panelists and a Stanford University student as part of our collaboration with the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford. We wanna take this opportunity to thank our partners and co-presenters in this program, chosen based on Arena and Adrian's deep connections to their communities. Stanford's Institute for Diversity in the Arts, Kearney Street Workshop, and Eastside Arts Alliance. We value each of these organizations for their ongoing commitment to nurture and support artists students, community members, and cultural workers in the Bay Area, and we look forward to continued collaboration. Many thanks also to the dedicated SFMOMA team working hard behind the scenes to make this program possible today. And since the, since the Stanford student will be asking prepared questions, we will also be able to answer any other questions the public might have using the chat function on both Zoom and YouTube. The event is currently being streamed to YouTube where live captioning is being provided in real time. This event is being recorded and will also be available for rewatching on SFMOMA's YouTube channel. And before we begin the artist talks, um, we wanted to introduce the scholars that will be in conversation with the artists later in the program. Um, Dr. Tiffany E. Barber is a scholar, curator, and critic of visual art, new media, and performance of the Black diaspora who has published widely on abstraction, Afrofuturism, Black feminist praxis, dance, and fashion. And Kazumi Chin is a poet, educator, and student of cultural studies at UC Davis. So now it's my honor to introduce artist Irina Alejo, born and raised in the Excelsior Mission and Soma districts of San Francisco. They integrate photography, archives, and performance with grassroots organizing, activism, 
and cultural preservation in their work. Hi, Rena. <laughs> Arena's SF MoMA commission, My Ancestors Followed Me Here, explores the textures, landmarks, and people along Mission Street before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. Their process of photographing and genuinely connecting with different cross sections of people and places informs their ongoing research into the complex dynamics of gentrification and displacement. Arena's advocacy and care for families, service workers, and tenants in these neighborhoods is evident through every gesture. And it has been so meaningful to work closely with Arena on bringing these voices and stories into the museum. Thanks, Arena. I think it's my turn then. Hi everyone, I'm Irina. If we can go to the next slide. That's me taken by Evelyn who works at Ida and, and the next slide please. And this is where I start my talk. So, magandang hapon, umaga o gabi. Ako po ay si Irina Alejo. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pagpunta sa ating pagtitipon. Good afternoon, morning or evening. I'm Irina, thanks for coming. I am humbled to work with Adrian, Lindy, and Sally for Bay Area Walls. Here, I anchor us in the ancestors' legacies and parallel histories formative to my practice. In the 1970s, photographer Crystal K. D. Huey photographed Filipino elders Claudio Domingo, Anacleto Moniz, and Luisa Mrs. D. De La Cruz tend to plants in the light well space of the International Hotel, also known as the I Hotel on San Francisco's Kearney Street. The forced eviction of these ancestors for the sake of urban renewal reflects our ongoing struggles with gentrification and displacement. By cultivating an inner city garden amidst community pain, these ancestors embody the role and process of solidarity and coalition building to fight for a future that puts people first. The I Hotel struggle represents the multi-ethnic, intergenerational, and cross-class activism integral to building ethnic studies as a pedagogy used across the nation, rooting from the solidarity work of black, indigenous, and people of color, LGBTQ plus folks, students, families, and allies who led the Third World Liberation Front strikes of 1968 and 69 at campuses like San Francisco State and UC Berkeley. These movements sparked the grassroots initiated coalitions I list in my slide the Committee on Black Performing Arts at Stanford, growing into the Institute for Diversity in the Arts, Kearney Street Workshop, the oldest Asian Pacific American multidisciplinary arts organization in the US, started in the basement of the I Hotel, and the Museum Intercommunity Exchange, or MIX at SF MoMA, a pilot program that outgrew the museum's confines, garnering renewed interest. Next slide, please. Thinking about these people-centered histories bring me to my North Star and years-long project, a history of renting, comprised of public interventions, photographs, installations, and a photo book. I look at the issue of housing as a human right through my ethnographic lens as a third-generation Filipino-American renter in my birthplace, San Francisco. Pictured are the book form of a history of renting and community organizer Tetet Naval with my mom, my family and I visited Tita Tet, or Auntie Tet, on her birthday to gift her a book and photo central to the book's narrative. Collaborating with my photo book team, curator Leanne Ladia, designer Jerlyn Jarun Pun Phillips, and contributing writers David Wu, Janet Delaney, and Jerome Reyes taught me to focus the project on the community cultural wealth we already possess as residents, renters, and co-conspirators. The book focuses on three San Francisco neighborhoods that raised me, the Excelsior, Mission, and South of Market, all threaded by Mission Street, a commercial and public transportation corridor, and ground zero for tech-fueled urban renewal projects and gentrification crises. Next slide, please. In my ancestors followed me here, I walked along Mission Street's 7.2 mile stretch prioritizing process over outcome as what I learned from my time at UC San Diego 
I composed a Fluxus score to map out my sensory parameters as a pedestrian engaging with storefronts, essential workers, and artists impacted by the multiple pandemics and injustices. This photo of the shuttered Eric's surplus store, iconic for its hand-painted Ben Davis sign representing San Francisco blue-collar families, was taken on the day of the orange skies during the California wildfires. Word of mouth led me to interview muralist George Harry Crampton Glasanus, who, with sign painter Charlie Ortola, anonymously restored the Ben Davis sign, reflecting their passion for preserving San Francisco history and culture. The project title arrived to me in my collaboration with artist Yeri Chu on a comic about cultural practices down to art techniques that follow us like footprints across the diaspora. The scholarship of Suzette Min teaches me about my practice and focus on seen and unseen labor. Min describes the power of Asian American art as unnameable, leveraging an encounter that is ongoing and uncounted beyond existing curatorial and institutional practices that both limit and facilitate futurities in the discourse. Next slide, please. The project teaches me the dynamic ways muralists use public space to honor ancestors, including shuttered storefronts in the Mission District. On the left, Max Martilla dedicates a building entrance to remember Ronnie Goodman, who was part of the Prestida Eyes family. On the right, Chris Gonzalez shows us the global scope of police brutality on Black and Palestinian communities through his mural of Brianna Taylor and Ayad Al-Halak, telling me, I literally pulled up on that wall and started painting it. No one was gonna stop me. I can't live another day without seeing this connection being made. Next slide, please. The indigenous Filipino ideology of togetherness known as Kapwa and in motion, Pakikipag Kapwa became my truth and portal in interviewing essential workers along Mission Street. In Tagalog, I learned from Tita Tess Diaz about her work ethic at JT Restaurant in Soma, Pilipinas, Filipino Cultural Heritage District. In Chinese, my collaborator Vita Kuang and I connected with Excelsior's Yan Yan Beauty Salon owner, An Huin, about her immigration to the US after Liberation Day in Saigon, Vietnam, as An cut Vita's hair. Next slide, please. In getting to know the workers at Mission District's Discount City, collaborator Lourdes Figueroa and I learned to embrace the refusal to be interviewed as a community right to self-representation. Implementing anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston's ethnographic technique of interpreting a cultural event through her own voice, Lourdes then documented our time at Discount City through a Spanish and English participatory observational account. It may be an afterthought, but it is, it is profound that Vida, Lourdes, and I are all queer women of color who naturally collaborated together for these multilingual interviews. My project is a comprehensive, accessible, and multisensorial record of life along Mission Street. It encompasses text and long-form interviews, visuals, audio recording, and material archives. As a timekeeper and oracle, I worked again with Jerilyn Jerun Poon Phillips to compile these testimonies into a newspaper I am distributing along Mission Street throughout the show, knowing that the very people centered in my work may never step into the museum, and that my purpose as an ethnographer is to subvert and connect these different worlds. Next and final slide, please. I'm greatly privileged to have this commission at a time when the hardships of families, small business workers, and artists, many who are immigrants working in middle class along Mission Street, have only intensified since the onset of the pandemic, and community distrust with arts institutions are more visible and pronounced as we are all radically reconsidering their role in structural equity and violence impacting our lives. It is my conscious decision to complete this commission, believing that it's meant to shift the equation inside and outside institutions. My work represents my communities, not institutions. In these photos, my neighbors, Lucy and Hayden, Hayden, whose birthday was just yesterday, and their mom, Liz, visit my and Adrian's exhibits. 
My newspaper exchanges with cultural anchors, Ana Lisa Escobedo and Sita Kuratomi Balmik, teach me about the complexity in creating and circulating images through the same vocabulary and rhythm used to capitalize on tragedy, including wildfires, documentation of police brutality, and abuse of power. We must hold these images and archives critically within and beyond museum walls. I think of their impact on future generations, our ancestors who continue to follow us, and the great care and grace required in how we share stories and advocate for our people. They do so much for us. Thank you. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Irina, um, for the wonderful presentation of your thoughtful work. And now I'm delighted to introduce artist Adrian L. Burrell. Born and raised in Oakland, Adrian is a storyteller who uses photography, film, and site-specific installation to examine issues of race, class, gender, and intergenerational dynamics. His SF MoMA commission, It's After the End of the World, Don't You Know That Yet?, features his grandmother, mother, and sister posing in front of murals across Oakland. The murals root the work in a specific time and place, but Adrian uses them more as a point of entry into a larger conversation about regeneration, effective labor, and the normalized violence inflicted on Black lives in American society. Connecting his own family histories with the stories depicted on the walls, he portrays public space in an intimate way as a personal space. Adrian considers the work a collective self-portrait delving into his family history to explore lineages of revolt against racial oppression. He sees the work as a call to action that interrogates how we confront our past and build our future. Adrian's passion and commitment to his art, family, and community is inspiring, and I admire his deeply personal approach to visual storytelling. It has been so rewarding to work with Adrian, and I am grateful that he could bring his creative vision to SF MoMA for his first museum exhibition. Thank you, Sally. Um, it's an honor to be here with everybody, and um, I'm really looking forward to getting into this, so I guess. Next slide. Uh, my family came to California and began coming to California in 1927. My grandmother fled in 1945 after my grandfather got into um, an altercation with a white man and the Ku Klux Klan were trying to kill him. I remember her telling me stories about being on a train, leaving Louisiana to Oakland and how they stopped in a, a city on the way and they just left her. She wasn't able to use the bathroom basically. And she had to wait for hours until they got back on the train and you know she, she figured it out. Um, this is her and my mom in the back seat of a 1972 glass house Chevy, is what we call them. And I call this photo Medea, Mama in the Glass House. Next slide. This is my great great grandmother, Alice Smith Seamster. And her and my great great grandfather, George Washington Seamster, well, him specifically, was born into slavery. And I just thought about as I go through these archives and see these are the oldest images that I have that so far of my family, to just think what it means to be able to access, to what it meant to access my grandmother, a person who was raised by people born into slavery. And the fact that she holds the memories, their memories and her own. And now via my storytelling and me just inquiring and asking questions, I'm able to access that experience and what to do with it from there. Next slide. Through the work of um, Dr. Tiffany Barber and Renato Anderson's Black Speculative Arts Movement, I start to think about the gaps that come into play when you are a Black American trying to figure out what your family history is. I went back to Louisiana. I went to West Africa. I did genealogy research and genetic research, trying to uncover stories. And even with talking with my grandmother sometimes, I realized there's certain, certain things that she just didn't want to remember. And I, I think that's okay. But at the same time, as a storyteller and as a person who's trying to trouble the archives, I think, how do I make up for those gaps? Next slide. 
this is my sister and my grandmother standing in front of a mural of Huey P. Newton in downtown Oakland. And my sister's been doing hair for the last 20 years. So one of the things that I wanted to do was collaborate with her. So I came to her and I said, hey, sis, you know, like, what if we make these steel wool wigs? And what you see now is a steel wool wig that my sister's wearing and my grandmother is wearing. And these wigs made me think about like, the process of making steel wool, how it's uh, used to clean houses, how it's something that's of utility and it was never meant to defy gravity. It was never meant to be beautiful. It was never meant to dance. And so I kind of thought to myself and worked with my sister on thinking, you know what, like how, we, how do we make this dance? Like, how do we make these, these wigs defy gravity? Next slide. This is an image of my mother, Vanessa Smith, standing in front of Mexicala Rose. It's a restaurant that's currently closed down and it's across the street from um, what used to be the county jail. And my childhood memories of going to Mexicali Rose are all involving me going to court for a loved one or you know, a family member or visiting a family member. And I just remember going into Mexicali Rose with my mom and, you know, we get a burrito, we sit down to like decompress or like get ready to go deal with police and deal with these institutions that were, you know, holding our loved ones and the types of emotions that it invoked in me as a child, not really understanding like what was going on and what was this, you know, interface between me and the person that I care about the most, the people that I care about the most. And this image is called God Don't Like Ugly. Next slide. So the, the exhibit is made up of around seven images, large scale images of my mom, sister, and grandmother. Uh, con concrete busts that hold the steel wool wigs that me and my sister collaborated to make together. And also a short film called Black Gold, which questions and thinks about the notion of the black angel of history, which are the archetypes that I'm kind of dealing with when it, in terms of my grandmother, sister, and mom. And the Black Angel history is basically like this archetype that goes through time and space to support revolutions and guard the souls of Black folks. And so as we took pictures in downtown Oakland and like made this film, that was, that's what was on my mind. And that's the direction that I gave my grandmother, my mom and sister. And I like this image a lot because it just feels like they're stepping out of some type of time machine, like those lights from the corner store, like kind of going like this and just them coming out of it. It just made me feel like, okay, cool. Like that's what I want. And also like my sister's holding this coin um, and it has a scale of justice on it. And during the summer, you know, a lot of us are thinking about justice. Even now we're still, we're going to always be thinking about it. What does that mean? And what decisions are we going to make now as a society, as a society moving into the future and how that determines the future that we're all going to have to cohabitate? Next slide. I was very lucky, very lucky. Um, I've been working on this type of work with my family for a few years now. And I got to ask my grandmother a lot of questions and I got to take a lot of photos of her and I got to deepen our relationship, not just between me and her, but my family's understanding of our history as black Americans and what that means and um, where we're gonna take it. And so my grandmother passed on in December 3rd, 2020 and she got a chance to see the work. Um, she, she's very happy, she was very happy with it. And I want to dedicate um, this exhibition to her. And yeah, that's what I got for you. Awesome. I, um, hello everybody. Um, I am um, Tiffany Barber, just to remind people um, um, who I am from the introduction that was gave, given. Um, I am so honored to be here and I wasn't really aware how much my scholarship has influenced Adrian's work until um, this presentation. So this is a real treat. Um, the Black Angel of History um, 
is an article that I co-authored with um, Dr. Ronaldo Anderson that um, is accessible online. Um, so I'll put that in the chat um, if, I remi if I remember to do so. But um, anyway, we'll, this is the part of the evening where um, Kazumi and I get to ask questions directly of the artists um, and to kind of go deeper into their practices. So I'm just gonna get started. And the first question is for Adrian. Um, as an artist, you began working in a documentary mode. Um, and research and family archives are now so central to your work, but you're also invested in speculation as a way to imagine the past, present, and future, as you talked about. Um, alternative futures wherein Black people simply exist um, rather than having to perform, be a commodity, be a site of projection for non-Black entertainment and consumption is also something that I think about um, regularly in my own work. Um, and so I just wanted to hear you talk about how you became an artist and what sources, whether visual, literary, sonic, or theoretical, um, you draw on for inspiration. Thanks, Dr. Barber. Um, yeah, I would say oral histories have a lot to do with my work. I was always that kid who was just asking questions, sitting around the old folks, like trying to figure it out, trying to understand to the point where I'm pretty much, I was a nuisance to them, I'm sure. Um, the work that we see today is like really, like I said, I took a lot and understood a lot from work that you've done, John Confra, um, Sun Ryan, just blending those things into the current moment to try to see what my spin on it could be or what could I add to the conversation. And as I said before, like working with my grandmother, a woman who gave birth to 16 kids and, you know, 12 of those kids had 58, 58 had 112, 112 had 158 and all pretty much being situated in Oakland, California, and just really trying to figure out a way to embody that story and that spirit through the work. Yeah, that really resonates with me. I was also that that kid who was constantly asking my grandmother about her family history and writing it down. I had a little notework, notebook with um, shamrocks on it that she gave me. That was a little weird. I was like, where does this come from? But um, I still have that notebook and I cherish it um, deeply because my grandmother is also no longer living. So um, thank you for this work. Um, and there are, are so many resonances between yours and Arena's work. Um, and though coming from different contexts and personal experiences, you both focus on family roots and relations, labor, race and ethnicity, very urgent social issues um, that we contend with every day as a collective. Um, and the portraits you both made for this exhibition also visually rhyme with one another in terms of composition, framing, the subject's poses and other things. Um, so there's something to be said about portraiture and its conventions that you two are bringing to the fore in the show. And it's really beautiful as people have already commented in the chat. Um, and you both additionally, as you said, turn toward um, oral histories and interviews in your individual practices to flesh out what can't be captured by the visual. Yeah, um, so what, what I was really drawn to um, is when you were talking about Ghazale, I think was their name, um, you quoted, I cannot live another day without seeing this connection being made. And I think like Dr. Barber, like, like that's so much of what this is, right? Like the connections that both of these artists are making, um, I cannot live without seeing this connection being made. So I was like, what does it mean to be unable to live? It's both figurative and literal. It shows us the stakes of our art to make connection like this. Um, without that connection, we cannot, right? To be unable to connect is to be unable to live. To connect is to live. To make connection is life. And part of what we're grounded in here in the Bay Area is thinking through this history of gentrification, um, how gentrification is the movement of capital and not people. Uh, these things like carcerality, policing, exclusion, these things make it hard for us to live in this urban space where our bodies are controlled, where it is difficult to us, for us to move, right? These things stop us from connecting both in terms of what we're thinking about, right? In terms of Palestine and our connection here or just with each other in other ways. Um, and this is a, for Arena, my question is, I see your, your project is so much grounded in like we come to the photographs in stillness, right? But your practice is grounded in movement. It's in the repetition of that movement. You walk through San Francisco and you make a ritual of walking and that's where the photographs emerge from. And so I was wondering if you can maybe talk about this a little bit about movement, about stillness, about how these things figure in your work. Yeah, thanks so much. And I, I definitely, I think to briefly touch upon 
mine and Adrian's works in this space, they're really, they face each other in some ways. Um, and also um, Chris Gonzalez's mural, uh, photo of, of his mural is facing, like I think Adrian's sculpture. So there's a lot of mirroring that's happening and it, it's like two parallel streets when I think about it. And to answer Kazumi's question, I really, I, I love being able to move in a space. The kineticism is what I look for as someone whose work is grounded in performance work. So I need to feel that motion. I need to do that. Like for me as a surfer, I need to be able to feel all the textures. And that's the same thing that I look for when I go to all these community events pre-pandemic, uh, show up and just take all these photos, even though I get so overwhelmed with all these archives that I have and people are wondering if I'm ever gonna put them together like five years later. Uh, I think these this is the conundrum that archivists have and this is the movement that I continue looking for even though these archives may remain still for a long period of time. There's a timeliness when they become relevant. And a lot of that is arising in this time of, of reckoning for so many, so many communities. There's so much pain. And I think in order for, for me to, to respond to that, I need to walk through Mission Street. We need to, be, to, to do that boots on the ground work even more now when we feel distant because of the pandemic, because of lockdowns. I love that you talk about this kind of um, moment of reckoning um, because both of you, both you and Adrian, engage in advocacy and social justice work inside and outside of art and academic institutions. And so I just wanted to hear both of you kind of talk about how you see these projects um, and any future work you might be currently creating um, in conversation with that facet of your working life, especially in terms of your imagined audiences and where we are in our current cultural climate. Um, yeah, it makes me think of an image, of an image, uh, the image God don't like ugly. And the fact that, you know, I was assaulted by a police officer in Vallejo recently. And, uh, a lot of people, you know, I don't know if they know about the Vallejo police department, but a lot of people have been killed by the Vallejo police department. And it's a certain amount of anger you get when somebody who is quote unquote supposed to protect you you know, takes your humanity from you in a certain kind of way in a moment. And it makes you honestly want revenge. A part of you wants revenge. A part of you wants to, you know, figure out like, and go through this process of understanding what that means. And for me, I turned that to the art. I turned that into, into organizing and trying to be a part of the solution. And I like, as you said, I don't believe that there's any separation for that from me in terms of my lived experience and the imagery and ideas that are coming about through my art because that's where I have to place that. I have to take that anger, I have to take that desire for change, desire for a reckoning and put it all into my imagery. And at the same time, build up on the resistance that is in my blood for my family, you know what I mean? To my grandmother and my grandfather saying, no, we won't to the, uh, to the Ku Klux Klan and me saying, no, I will not stop filming you to play OPD. Yeah, that reminds me, Adrian, uh, when I was interviewing, I was sitting in George Crampton's she um, Chevy, I think, it's, he's really into old cars, but we were sitting by uh, Presida Park and, um, and he was talking about Sean Monterosa, who was killed by the Vallejo police. And these histories come when we're able to really look at walls in, in the city and really see what's expressed on there, the anger the relentlessness, uh, the cycle. And for me, what I'm, what I'm hoping to do in this project, the phase of my ancestors followed me here is now distributing the, the newspaper that Jerlyn and I have made. And so that's another, I think for me, once again, it's back to the stillness. It makes me feel pretty anxious that the work just kind of sits in the museum especially with all the restrictions that Adrian and I had to work through with Lindy and Sally to, you know, during the pandemic, it's like, I can't, I have a book, but I can't have people touch it because of safety and health considerations. And so 
I think, how does my work continue to live outside of the museum space while it's still up? So that's kind of how I want to continue that movement. I'm also looking into, right now I have a project that's gonna be put up at SOMART's Cultural Center in San Francisco about people's right to open spaces and sunlight and the role of parks, the role of parks and housing affordability. So that's, that's what I'm looking into after this project. I wanted to highlight also uh, before I, I'm, I'm so eager to learn more of Dr. Barber and Kazumi's work and scholarship. Adrian, I, I mentioned to you before we ran into each other at SF Camera Work, but then we didn't really we didn't really run into each other. It was when I was with Janet Delaney and she was showing me the space. And that was, I think, the day before your photos were put up for your show at SF Camera Work. So I was actually looking at Adrian's photo of this boy with fireworks in the backdrop. And, and I was like, wow, whose works are these? And then there goes Adrian at the bottom of SF Camera Works trying to haul a table inside or outside of the space. Uh, so I think it's just all these, and that was in 20, 2019. So uh, I, I think it's beautiful how cyclical things are. And I, I know too, in, in the future, there will be more collaborations in even the powerful connections that we have here with Kearney Street Workshop, with Institute for Diversity in the Arts and SF MoMA. Yeah, um, I'm glad you're thinking through the, like, again, like I was so drawn to the connections that were being made here. Um, I think you answered the question that I wanted to ask you. So maybe I have a question for Adrian. Um, you said there were some things that your grandmother just didn't want to remember. And as I was looking at the photographs, I, I was very drawn to the ones that featured your grandmother. And you asked this question, how do we make up for these gaps um, when we want to trouble the archive? And so I was wondering if you had maybe more thoughts as to how do you handle this space when you know you have an elder who does not want to remember? Um, and how do you, you know, create art responsibly in that space? I think uh for me, it was a lot about a, a lot about being quiet because there were things that she didn't want to talk about, but I can always feel it. Like, I, okay, I would make it, I would make it a thing that I would always go cook with my grandma. Like, I would sit in the kitchen with her and we clean and pick greens and just talk and talk, and I I would do more listening. And the things that she didn't want to talk about would come out in metaphors, or they would come out in like certain ways to where I would know it, but I didn't know it, but I would know it if you know what I mean. And I think that I just kind of sit with that and think about how do I represent that in the artwork, even though it may not be literal, it might also be metaphor metaphorical in the same way that she would speak, you know, um, and what it means to like hold on to a phrase, even like uh, God don't like ugly or uh, uh, you think fat meat ain't greasy. Like these things that she would say that people are like, what does that mean? Or how does that deal with anything? But it's, it goes all the way back to like her upbringing and the things that her grandparents told her and the things that they would talk about. So for instance, um, she would say, you run, the so-and-so's outside and they're acting wild as Cooter Brown. And I'm like, who is Cooter Brown? Like who is a wild, these black people, who is Cooter Brown? And then I Google and I do some research and it's like, there's an actual narrative of a indigenous, half indigenous, half black man who, didn't want to fight in the civil war, but was being forced by the Confederates in some kind of way to fight in the civil war. And he disappeared and everybody was like, whatever happened to Cooter Brown? So my grandmother may not have necessarily known that story, but she carried this phrase with her that she then passed on to me. And when I did the research to understand what it was, it revealed a whole narrative and a history out of Louisiana that I'd never heard before. So I guess it's about patience, it's about listening, and it's about being open to things that come out in metaphors and not the literal. Thank you. Wow, yeah, echoing folks in the chat who are just, yo, this was so amazing. Um, and it's been so great to hear you both talk so deeply about your respective practices. And to Irina's prompt to hear more about what Kazumi and I think of the work, I just wanted to make one last connection that resonates with me and my work. Um, and I think Kazumi's kind of spoken to some of their interests in terms of walking and um, 
memory and gaps and things like that. And so maybe Kazumi will have more to say, but the title for Adrian's body of work, um, It's After the End of the World, Don't You Know That Yet, is taken from an album released in 1970 by Sun Ra and his Intergalactic Research Orchestra. So I just wanted to big up Sun Ra because he is a huge figure um, within Afrofuturism, which is um, a part of my scholarship. Um, and I also referenced this title um, the album title in the virtual exhibition that I curated last year called Curating the End of the World, um, exactly when the pandemic kind of, um, we were all shuttered by the pandemic, I should say. Um, and Sun Ra believed that he was otherworldly, um, he was not of this earth, um, and that the only way Black people could be free from violence and oppression was to escape to space. Um, and Adrian's use of Sun Ra's title really urges us to consider what new futures can, can we, must we, chart in times of crisis um, after the end of the world. And paired with Arena's mention of refusal as self-representation, both artists really call us to question how the past comes to bear on the present and what's gained and potentially even lost when we center visibility and representation as a means toward progress when so many black and brown folks continue to endure relentless and extreme forms of assault, surveillance, policing, and violence. And so I just wanted to amplify that. Um, I don't know if Kazumi has any closing remarks before we move on to the next portion of the evening. Yeah, thanks. I'm really vibing with that end of the world because like I remember that sky, right, that you captured in the photograph. Like, what do we do at the end of the world? This felt like the end of the world. I wrote in my journal, I wrote, I wake up and it is 6 a.m. and I wake up and it is 6 a.m. And it just, that was the day, right, that we did not see the sky or we did not see the sun. And what you'd photographed then was the restoration of this mural, right? And I think, again, there's another like instructive for us that you're capturing and you're walking, right? What do we do at the end of the world, right? We, we, we make this kind of art that has the ability, like what this other person that you're citing says, to, to make those connections, right? This is a historical project, you know, that you're, cap you're not making the historical project in and of itself, right? But you're also capturing the kind of histories that people themselves are making and you're relaying those to us and you're finding the connections that need to be made at the end of the world so that we can continue to thrive as artists and as a community and, you know, just like work together within this space that we share. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for both of y'all's work. And I guess we're moving on to uh, maybe, I think you were gonna introduce our um, next speaker. Yep, next we have Shannon Torres, who's a student from Stanford University's Institute for Diversity in the Arts, which we've heard so much about tonight, um, who's going to ask some questions of their own that will build on what Kazumi and I have already posed to the artists. Um, Stanford's Uni Institute for Diversity in the Arts supports visionary arts leadership by stewarding the power of the arts towards social justice, which is very appropriate for what we have been talking about tonight. The IDA believes that cultural change precedes political change and that the arts are a powerful means of cultivating difference dismantling oppression and building more sustainable futures. Um, Shannon Torres is a fourth year um, at Stanford majoring in comparative studies and race and ethnicity with a concentration in identity, diversity, and aesthetics. And that's just amazing. I never had that as an undergrad as an option to major. I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> and they are a former Institute for Diversity in the Arts fellow at Stanford. As a Dominican American, they're interested in the rich legacies of Black Dominican and Haitian rural insurgency, as well as radically alternative archival practices. Yes, thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for the presentations and discussions and especially the warmness of this space. Um, I'm sure we're all feeling it tonight. Um, it's wonderful to be able to ask you both a question. I know Arena and I'm, I'm very honored. And I was thinking I'd start off with Arena and give you the space to respond and then transition to the question I have for Adrian. Um, Dr. Barber um, touched on this visibility as not necessarily emancipatory. And I was wondering if you could speak to the sort of politics of legibility and the unnameable, unnameable like you discussed in this work and in your work. I'm thinking of public art and archives as vehicles for embodied and communal care, but that can also be weaponized and seized by quote unquote outsiders. When you are in the technical and even poetic process of collecting and photographing, and then you said distributing, how do you choose what remains legible and illegible? What parts of your art others can see and learn about, especially as you uphold and magnify community advocacy? Thank you, Shannon, so much for your question. And I'm just been, we've just been really grateful to work with you in your four years at Stanford. For me, just kind of a year, I'm such a big fan of you. To, 
it, this also helps answer the question from the chat on the YouTube portion about what informed this decision to focus on murals. So from my understanding how it was, how I arrived at this commission, there was an interest from SF MoMA to, for, to commission photographers to photograph walls, murals. And sometimes for me, when I work within what I feel like is already limited or a prompt, especially from an institution, I sometimes kind of want to subvert that. So I was working with Lindy to really work through my frustrations of trying to figure out what kind of murals I should be looking at to meet the prompt of the institution. And then I also, but I, because I was more drawn to non-mural, I, my work is really about photographing buildings that change across decades. And for me, um, in this commission that it took me three months or less, uh, it's really something I wasn't used to as someone who works long-term across years. So I had to compress five years of my practice into three months and looking at and trying to meet this prompt with all these institutional deadlines and navigating all the bureaucracies of that with our curatorial team who helped us so, so well to advocate for us. So when looking at what legible is, I, th I think I really draw to what I grew up around in the Excelsior, it's it's still it's one of the last bastions of spaces in San Francisco where it's not so hyper gentrified like the South of Market skyscrapers, sales forest towers that are empty now. We don't have that yet in Excelsior. However, there is a plan by our supervisor and the San Francisco Planning Commission across the next ten years to build housing mostly market rate along Mission Street, and that cuts through Excelsior. So the, right now, the legibility in Excelsior are these very humdrum walls. We don't really have um, capital to commission artists for murals. So I was really drawn to what's here, debris, blight, beautiful graffiti by our community members, sideshows at like 11 p.m., you know, on like Geneva and Alemania at like Saturday night, you're about to go to sleep. Uh, these, this is what my community thrives in. This is what we value. So I wanted to really learn how to balance that with also the, the attention we have on muralists using storefronts and storefronts, streets during the pandemic. This was a way for muralists and business owners to really work together to use and activate spaces, despite you know, a lot of the pain of shuttering businesses. So I'm not really sure if I'm answering the legibility question, but it roots once in summary, it roots from what I see in my in my own outside my window and what I smell and what I feel and what I touch, and also what's responding to the current moment and, and contemporary. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, you definitely answered my question. Um, and on this idea of illegibility and legibility and storytelling, um, this question's for, for Adrian. I'm also working with oral histories from my grandmother as part of a sort of cultural reckoning of Black Dominican memory, um, my own sort of archival project. And I've deliberated how my archive can do her justice and her stories justice, and then that representation and what justice means. Um, and in answering Kazumi's question, you talked about sitting back and listening to your grandmother. And I thought that was, I really related to that. I thought it was really fascinating. And I was wondering how you engage with memory and agency, specifically in representing your grandmother now that she's physically not here. Um, and I know you talked about collaboration with your sister, but I would just really love to, to hear that. Yes, thank, thank you. And I'm glad that you're doing that project. And I think that for me, the best thing that can happen in terms of my work is that I hope that other people like black and brown people across the diaspora, like they just, people also find a way to make models for other people to like study their family histories and like reveal and dig into what like our kinship will reveal for our, for our communities. Um, and in terms of the agency, like a lot of the work, like I have a, a letter that my grandmother wrote 
And the prompt was like, grandma, I want you to write a letter to the future. And she asked me, she's like, what does that mean? Like, I'm like, what's your hopes? What's your desires? Like, what do you care about? Um, what do you want to see? And so she was kind of like tripping out about the letter for a minute because she thought it was weird. Like, and I would always, now that I think about it, I kind of was, you know, she was older. She was, you know, an, an older person. So I was kind of preparing myself for that loss and me and her would talk about it a lot. She's like, what are you going to do? after I die. I was like, well, I got all these videos. I got these photos. I got this and I'm going to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I feel like me and her were in sync enough to where I would, I would know like what I should not be doing and what I should be doing. And also my grandmother was a really savvy person that she didn't tell. I know there's a lot of things she took to the grave. Um, and there's just things she wouldn't, she wouldn't talk to me about and she wouldn't talk to anybody about. And I respect that. And, um, it reminds me of a time where I wanted to go back to Louisiana with her so bad before the pandemic. I said, grandma, let's go back to Louisiana. Like I had the whole family amped up about it. And she told me at first she would think about it. Then she told me, you know, she was, she was sick, which at the time she, she, you know, she really, she kind of wasn't. And um, then finally she told me, she says, I don't want to go back there. I hate that place. I don't want to go back there. And I said, I thought about it and it was so much said and what wasn't said. And I said, okay, grandma, it's all good. Like, you know, we'll figure something else out. And I left it alone and I never brought it up again. That's incredible. And I find myself going through some of those similar processes um, and definitely depending on communication to straightforward with my grandma. Um, and that's incredible. Thank you both so much for answering my questions. I, ju I really just love hearing Adrian talk about um, your, his relationship with his grandmother because it's it's very it's so similar to mine. My grandmother grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and left when she was in her I don't I think she went back maybe when she was like forty five, and then she basically never went back until the very end of her life, like within a year. She went back and then she and then she passed and it was just like that same she there were so many things that she refused to talk about mostly because of uh you know her upbringing and kind of family relations that she was like i'm i'm not going there i she felt abandoned and so she just never went home <laughs> for like 40 years um and then i i think she knew that she was getting close and so she went back and had a great time with her family and um, saw her mother's grave, which she hadn't seen um, before that time. And so I think she made closure and then she went on. <laughs> um, so these, I mean, these stories and, you know, these, these genealogies um, that we track are so, are so uh, complex and layered, um, like the work that you've shared with us tonight. And um, there is a question in the chat that I wanted us to get to because it actually relates to a question that Kazumi and I had for both artists, which is what are the challenges that you faced um, in making this exhibition? And this will be the last thing I think that we talk about tonight, unless there's another question that comes in the chat. But the, art, the, um, the question from Dawn is, um, let me read it. Uh, oh, it went away. <laughs> Um, what sort of protocols are you building in with formalized art world institutions and individuals that are supporting your work to ensure that you that you are not or that they are not co-opting you and your work's themes for their own gain? And what structures do you have in place to hold them accountable if they do so? Um, and you can speak to the project that you did with SFMOMA. You can talk about more broadly um, the future of your practices, what you learned in this process, but challenges and, and what you learned is basically what the question is. You want to go first, Serena, or I can go? Um, I would say one contracts are very important. Um, and you should have a lawyer if you know one look at the contract and you should look at look at it yourself and make sure that you're okay with everything that it says. And if you're not, you should speak up about it. Um, I think also too, like places like, you know, SF MoMA or any institution are coming to us as artists to make a work and you can't forget that you're the artist so make the work um and sometimes you have to cut out all the noise and just say okay this is what i'm going to make um and stand on it that. that's that's what i would say 
Yeah, I mean, I, Adrian and I had a lot of just a lot of just behind the scenes phone calls and text messages to make sure that we're unified on the front when we're asking for things, when we're presenting things to Lindy and Sally, who help us translate things to to upper heads and, and SF MoMA, because it's such a large as what my colleague and manager says about Stanford Arts, it's a big uh, cruise ship. St uh, Stanford and SF MoMA are in that same way, which is very different from like a little hut or a little garden, how I identify with KSW or Soma Pilipinas, my home communities. So I think a big part of that was one, I'm, I love being able to collaborate. I'm just really grateful, Adrian, that I got to share this time with you and this space. And I felt more at ease learning how to advocate for what I needed in my work because I got to work with you and we were unified in that front. Um, and also we, we were learning with Lindy and Sally who are really great allies in supporting us as local artists and perhaps the specific cultural needs we have as local artists responding to a prompt and responding through our own lenses. I think a big part of what I learned with Lindy and navigating working with SF MoMA is um, it was unusual in my project that I had so many people involved in it because of the collaborative nature of my work, like figuring out how much to pay interviewees, how much per hour, figuring out how is, is there a budget for translations in Tagalog, in Chinese, in Spanish? If it's not within the staff's capacity, do we have a budget for, con for someone to be contracted for that? And at first, initially, that wasn't there, but then we were able to, I was, I'm really grateful to work with Lindy, who helped me figure out and navigate how to ask for those things, because that's, that's the nature, that's what my, my values are in my work. And I think what led to it when, um, People have been visiting the exhibit for my labels. It's multilingual. And that was something I, I didn't even know was possible for, for my work. Thank you so much um, for talking so openly about these issues of power and labor and value on the side of the artist and working with institutions um, and how to draw boundaries with them um, that uh, is itself a practice of, of care, right? Um, Cause then we do have anything else to share before we wrap up. I do not. Would you like to send us off? I'm gonna send us off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Shannon, for your, I mean, just incredible questions, like very thoughtful um, and so resonant with my own thinking. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to the artists, Adrian and Irina for sharing your rich layered practices with us um, and, acts, and being so vulnerable and open about your processes. Um, you both gave us so much to talk about and think about um, tonight and that will stay with us going forward. Um, huge thanks to all of you for attending too and for being active in the chat, bigging everybody up, um, bringing the energy because it's really hard on Zoom. So um, thank you so much for being in the Zoom room with us tonight um, and for this energizing conversation um, on Arena and Adrian's incredible work, which you can see um, through September 6th um, at the museum. The exhibition will, will be up until September 6th. So and, thank and you all for an incredible night. And can I thank you too? Because <laughs> uh, it was very nice working with you. So absolutely, absolutely, you. yes. So this, yeah. was real, this was a real pleasure, such a treat. I just, my heart is full. So thank you. Thank y'all.